when you walk into the um, emergency room at SF General, uh, if you've ever been there, been to any ER, you know that it's really a very tense and crazy place. When you walk into the ER at SF General, though, if you walk in there with a gunshot wound, you might get seen in an hour. Um, it's a very busy, very chaotic place. And so when I walked in there uh, of my own volition and yet got triaged in and saw a nurse within half an hour, I knew I was pretty badly off. And I had gone in that day because I was feeling really sick, like really very sick, which is not super unusual because, you know, I'm an alcoholic and a lot of my life was spent feeling pretty shitty, but that day was especially rough and very difficult. And I'd walked into the ER after calling a friend of mine describing my symptoms of this dizzy and sick and nauseous and sweating yet cold and had terrible abdominal pain and thought I might be hallucinating just a little. And she suggested that I go to the ER immediately and six or seven hours later I did mostly just because it got so terrible. I could barely stand up and after taking my vital signs, the ER nurse walked me right in to a waiting room. And I knew I was an alcoholic and I knew that my life was not on the right track and I was finally ready, I felt, to tell someone, you know, to actually come out and say, you know, I need help. And I thought that maybe this trip to the ER would be the impetus I needed. It would let me be able to tell someone what my problem was. And I determined that when they came in to take my medical history, I would tell the doctor what was wrong. And so a nurse came in and started asking me the questions. What's your age? What's your height? What's your weight? You know, have you had any blood pressure problems in your family? Any history of cancer? Any history of heart disease? He asked me about my sexual history. He asked me about my drug use. He never asked me about my alcohol use. And if he had, I would have told him that pretty much before I even opened my eyes in the morning, I had my hand on the fifth of whiskey, Jack Daniel, that was sitting by my bed every night. But he didn't ask, and I just couldn't come out and say it. I, I just couldn't. So six or seven hours later, after they had run every manner of test on me, and again, I was sure that if they looked at my, my blood work that it would reveal that my liver was damaged beyond repair. I mean, because to be honest, I was drinking uh, a fifth of Jack Daniels um, before lunch, pretty much just to get myself going. Throughout the day, I drank probably a six pack of some sort of beer or wine equivalent, just to function, just to keep going. And somehow, somehow, when the doctor walked back in with my blood work and said, you're fine. Your blood pressure's a little high, your potassium level's a little off, but otherwise we can't find anything wrong with you. They sent me home from the ER after I'd been there for 10 hours with a prescription for blood pressure meds. And I walked down 24th Street out at SF General. It was about 7 in the morning, a little before then. And I clutched the little bag of pills in my hand, walked down to 24th in Florida where there was a, a, a liquor store that was um, not open yet. And I just stood there, waited for the five minutes until it opened, walked in, bought a pint of Jack Daniels, and drank it down straight right around the corner. And suddenly everything became fine. Everything fell into focus and I felt clear. My anxiety drops, everything else fell away. And I realized that the reason I had been so anxious and so fucked up was because I hadn't drank anything that day. I was going through withdrawal and that's how bad it was. So realizing that I really did need serious help. I came out to my friends. I called three of my closest friends and said, you guys, I'm seriously alcoholic. I don't know what I'm going to do to help myself. And they were so delighted. They came right out and said, we're going to help you. We're going to get you into detox. We're going to find a place for you to go. But first, we're going to help you to get your life together. And they were very determined and very wonderful and came over to my house. Now, mind you, it was a fight for them to even for me to even allow them into my home, right? Because it pretty much looked like an episode of, um, what is that show, Hoarders? Uh, being an alcoholic means you're not really super diligent on taking care of your own personal space a lot of the time. And so we had to hire a moving company to come in, three guys, it took them all day to empty out the trash, garbage, filth, and just flotsam and jetsam of the past two years of my attempt to drink myself to death. They found for me a detox center, but we weren't sure I was going to be able to get in because there was a waiting list. Um, they took me down to the place where they do 
the um, the triage for this detox center and the place was called Joe Healy and uh, they wanted to see if they could possibly get me in and I sat down and the intake nurse started asking me about my drinking habits and I started telling her and now these guys are professionals so I'm assuming they're not supposed to actually register shock but both of her eyebrows went up when I started describing my drinking habits and so I said well you know I'd say probably by noon I was drinking about a, uh, a pint or so I said I had probably about a fifth a day of whiskey and you know then some beer and some wine and whatever else was around is is that a lot and she looked at me and said well it's an unusual drinking pattern for a woman your age I guess they don't get many 37 year olds who are killing that much booze before noon and as it turned out they found a space for me at the um, at the Joe Healy uh, Center which is right on the corner of Page and Goff in a little three-story uh, apartment building that wouldn't look any different from any other except I happen to know that a lot of people are fighting for their lives in that building and I was one of them and by the time they took me in there that first day uh, I was in bad shape um, but it's a medical rehab and so what's great about it is that they have nurses on duty to help you through and to give you medication and and, and to make sure that you don't actually die of, uh, of seizures because that's a really uh, strong possibility is that you walk in there as an alcoholic going through withdrawal and seizures will get you. So I was eligible for all kinds of really fun and awesome drugs as it turned out. Uh, my first day in I was interviewed by the intake nurse and she told me she was going to hand me over to a counselor and the counselor talked to me about my drinking habits and I understood then really how fucked up I was. Um, but I was there and I was going to get help and I figured that the worst was over that I had actually said out loud I'm an alcoholic and let go of that fear that I'd had that this somehow made me a bad person or crazy that first night I fell asleep and woke up to the floor of my room bulging uh, as though a bubble were forming in the ground and the linoleum was pushed up probably about two or three feet so that it was as high as my bed and reaching eye level and expanding as though this huge intake of breath was filling the floor. And I looked around and said, okay, I, I don't think this is actually happening, but I feel really pretty fucking awake. And suddenly the bubble burst open and sitting in front of me was a huge, smelly, panting hyena. Like from the Savannah hyena, an actual animal, was sitting with me now in my room and looked at me with these huge black glistening eyes and opened its mouth and kind of yawned and shook its head and said, Hi, I'm Bubbles. And I said, Hello, um, I'm having a really bad hallucination, I think, or something. And she said, Yeah, you know, that's not really relevant. What's important now is that you get up and get dressed and walk out of here and get a drink because we need a drink right now. I wasn't sure if I had lost my mind or if I was having a very vivid hallucination or DTs and I'd heard about people having pink elephants appear before them and that sounds like some sort of Disney hyperbole but I swear to fucking God there was a hyena in my goddamn room and I burst into tears and rolled away from it and spent the next three or four hours listening to her tell me that we needed to drink we needed to get up and go right now because staying in here would kill us it would not be okay for us to be here we had to go and drink until the sun rose and it was finally time for our first meeting and I went to my counselor and said hey you know what um I had a really weird uh dream maybe hallucination and I described the hyena to her and she said well you know um, people can see a lot of crazy shit when they're going through withdrawal. But all right. Our days in uh, rehab were filled with a lot of meetings and a lot of counseling and a lot of television. And between myself and the 15 other heroin addicts, crackheads, and drugs, there was a lot of debating over what we should watch on television. And you're gonna laugh, but the one thing we all agreed was cool to watch was Deadliest Catch. I don't know why, but regardless, crackhead, drunk, heroin person, everyone loved Deadliest Catch. Perhaps it was the tension and the bonding of the fishermen, or maybe it was just the monstrosity of having these huge 
ancient looking creatures pulled on deck but we would watch that religiously and if there was a marathon on forget about it and I would watch TV as late as I possibly could because every night when I went back to my room this hyena was waiting for me and she would crawl from under the bed and look at me with that glassy stare and explain how much we needed to drink right now right now right now and I had a terrible terrible fear and I didn't know what to say I finally uh, after the first week of this called a friend of mine and said, hey, you know, I know that you're into, you know, sort of alternative um, religious stuff, and I'm having kind of a weird thing going on for me. I'm here in rehab, I know you are aware of that. And um, so funny thing is that this hyena <laughs> came uh, bursting out of the floor to tell me that we needed to drink. Is there any sort of significance in that? And she paused for a moment and said, you know, I haven't worked with a hyena in the spirit realm before. Tell me about what she says to you. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, um, what, she basically just wants us to drink. And I can't, I, I, I want to just hit her in the face with a lead pipe, but I'm afraid and I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to resist her. And she said, don't resist her. Listen to what she has to say. I said, oh. So I did. For the next three weeks, while I was sitting there at the corner of Page and Goff in the Joe Healy, re, re, Joe Healy Rehab, I listened to this filthy, hot, sweating, panting beast scream at me and beg me and implore me and whisper to go and leave and drink and drink and go. It's time. We have to go. Well, 21 days is the duration of the program, and although... Uh, they really wanted me to stay and do a longer term. I had to get back to my life. I had to get back to my job. I wasn't ready to go, but I had to go. And on that last day, I had reached out to some friends and was hoping that perhaps someone could come and meet me so that I would have someone to leave with, you know, and sort of have this triumphant exit from rehab. I made it 21 days sober. At least I've got that. But my friends were working and my friends were busy and my friends had stuff to do. And so I wound up walking out of there after three weeks into the bright, gorgeous sunlight on the corner of Goff and Page, alone, except I wasn't alone. I had my hyena with me. And it was an odd sensation to have this freedom and to know at this point she might win. It might be that I walk out of there, walk into a liquor store and pick up that Jack Daniels and start from where I left off. I had no one there to go with me, no one there to protect me from myself. You know. I wound up walking up Goff, crossed, uh, crossed Market, and went under the freeway under Valencia, walking in the sun, and I could hear her walking next to me. And I kept thinking to myself, this is just a dream, this is just a dream. But it wasn't. It was my life. And it also wasn't a dream when... Uh, big black guy came walking up to me under the freeway and was carrying a huge heavy duffel bag and he stopped and looked at me real furtive like you know and I looked up at him and I was dragging my bag behind me and I could hear bubbles breathing next to me I didn't know what this guy wanted and he stepped in real close to me and zipped open his bag and offered it to me and said hey you interested and I looked in this bag and I thought to myself oh God, and I rewound through my whole life, and I thought, you know, I'm going to say I have never had anyone offer to sell me booze on the street. Drugs I've gotten, sex I've gotten, people have offered all sorts of things, but never booze. And then I laughed because he was trying to sell me Tanqueray gin, and gin is the only alcohol even when I was at the height of being a fucking drunk, to which I would say no. And even as I stood in the sun and looked down into the glittering, greedy eyes of my own hunger for booze and looked back at the sky, I was able to smile and say, you know what, I'm cool. I'm cool. And so we kept walking, me and Bubbles, and although I knew I wasn't ever going to be alone again, I was okay with that. And I knew that somehow we would make it. 